welcome to our world news program. Today, we've got some intriguing headlines to dive into. First up, in Iran's presidential election, hardliner Saeed Jalalai is leading in the early results, but not enough to secure an outright win, hinting at a potential runoff. Next, an Australian diplomat has commented on the complexities of adding new partners to the AUKUS defense pact, suggesting that expansion might not be on the cards anytime soon. And finally, Vietnam's economy has shown impressive growth of 6.93% in Q2, driven by steady export growth and rising domestic consumption, though global uncertainties loom large. Please stay tuned for the detailed coverage of these stories and more. Associated Press, in the early results of Iran's presidential election, hardliner Saeed Jalalai leads with 4.26 million votes, closely followed by reformist Masoud Pazeshkian with 4.24 million votes. Iranian state television reported these numbers, indicating a potential runoff election as no candidate has a clear majority yet. The election's turnout figures, crucial for assessing public support for Iran's Shiite theocracy, have not been disclosed. Other candidates include hardline parliament speaker Mohammad Bagar Kalabaf with 1.38 million votes and Shiite cleric Mostafa Pormohammadi with over 80,000 votes. The results reflect a tense political atmosphere in Iran, with the electorate's stance on the theocratic regime under scrutiny. Japan Times, adding new partners to the AUKUS defense pact, which currently includes Australia, the US, and Britain, would be complicated, according to senior Australian diplomat Paul Myler. Speaking from Washington, Myler noted that the US Congress is not keen on expanding the agreement, initially formed in 2021 to counter China's growing influence. The first pillar of AUKUS focuses on providing Australia with nuclear-powered submarines, while a second pillar considers the development of high-tech weaponry with potential new partners. Myler highlighted the significant progress in reforming U.S. export control restrictions, which could pave the way for easier collaboration among the current AUKUS members. Nikkei Asia, Vietnam's economy grew by 6.93% in the second quarter, surpassing the 5.66% growth seen in the first quarter, as the country continues its uneven recovery from the pandemic. The General Statistics Office reported steady export growth of 12.5%, driven by electronics and seafood, though domestic consumption lagged at 5.78%. Economists are divided on whether Vietnam will raise interest rates to curb inflation, which stood at 4.39% in the first quarter. The IMF's Paolo Metis warned of high downside risks, including weakened exports due to global economic uncertainties and geopolitical tensions. Despite these challenges, analysts like Tim Lelehafen of Standard Chartered Bank believe Vietnam's recovery remains on track, though economic hurdles such as rising prices and infrastructure issues persist. The IMF emphasized the need for renewable energy and productivity gains to sustain growth amid climate change and an aging population, while also highlighting the importance of anti-corruption efforts for high-quality development. Associated Press, Simone Biles is on the brink of securing her third trip to the Olympics, leading the U.S. Olympic trials with an all-around score of 58.900. Despite not performing at her peak, Biles remains a dominant force, standing well ahead of her competitors. However, the path behind her is fraught with challenges as top contenders Shalise Jones and Kayla DeCello suffered injuries, potentially opening opportunities for other Olympic veterans. Jordan Childs, who helped the U.S. win silver in Tokyo, is regaining form and finished in the top six on all events. Sunny Salee, the 2020 Olympic champion, and Jade Carey, the reigning Olympic champion on floor exercise, are also in the mix. Biles, despite some uncharacteristic mistakes, remains the frontrunner, particularly after nailing her signature Yurkenko double pike vault. The trials have seen significant setbacks with Jones and DeCello's injuries, adding to the drama and uncertainty of the final team selection. South China Morning Post, Hong Kong's first hydrogen refueling station, located in a city bus depot in West Kowloon, has been operational since February, fueling the city's only zero-emission bus. This project is part of a broader initiative involving 14 pilots by 10 firms, supported by the government's green tech and new energy transport funds. City Bus is testing both hydrogen and battery electric buses, with hydrogen models showing advantages in mileage, refueling time, and passenger capacity. The company plans to expand its hydrogen bus fleet and refueling infrastructure, aiming to transition to zero emissions by 2045. However, the cost of hydrogen remains high compared to diesel, and the government is urged to provide more financial and regulatory support to foster the hydrogen economy. The new hydrogen development blueprint and upcoming legislative changes are steps towards this goal, 
but stakeholders call for more aggressive measures to ensure hydrogen can play a significant role in Hong Kong's decarbonization efforts. South China Morning Post, actress Jalen Yi has made a historic debut as the first Chinese transgender female character on British television with her role in the Amazon Prime series Dead Hot. The series, a comedy thriller, has received positive reviews, with Ye's performance being particularly praised. Born and raised in Guangdong, China, Yi faced bullying in her youth and came out as a transgender female in 2022. She moved to Manchester, UK, where she pursued a career in acting, makeup artistry, and modeling. Her role in Dead Hot was initially written for a cisgender woman, and Yi was cast based on her performance, not her identity, which she finds significant. She aims to increase representation for Chinese and transgender communities and hopes to explore opportunities in the US. Yi dreams of one day standing on an award stage, proudly representing her Chinese roots and advocating for the visibility of queer people in China. South China Morning Post, concrete pillars once dotted the landscape of Malolos, north of Manila, as part of a billion peso Chinese-backed rail project aimed at revolutionizing transport in the Philippines. Fast forward 16 years, and these pillars have been dismantled after the North Rail scheme was abandoned amid corruption allegations. Now, a new structure rises 200 kilometers northwest in a Philippine naval base on Luzon's western shores, the country's first supersonic cruise missile outpost, equipped with BrahMos missiles capable of striking Scarborough Shoal, where Chinese naval forces have gathered. This military installation marks the latest flashpoint in the deteriorating relationship between Manila and Beijing. The once promising partnership has devolved into a tale of betrayal and confrontation, with the Philippines and China now embroiled in an escalating geopolitical rivalry. Beijing's assertion of nearly complete ownership of the South China Sea through its Nine Dash Line has led to encroachments on waters claimed by the Philippines, causing relations to hit a historic low. A violent clash on June 17, when Chinese vessels attacked Filipino forces during a resupply mission, further strained ties with the Philippines condemning China's aggressive actions and Beijing offering a starkly different account. The situation remains volatile, with both nations trading accusations and the risk of miscalculation ever-present. Associated Press, the head of conflict armament research, Jonah Leff, presented irrefutable evidence to the United Nations Security Council that ballistic missile remnants found in Ukraine originated from North Korea. This revelation has intensified clashes between the United States and its Western allies against Russia and North Korea who were accused of violating a UN embargo on arms exports from the DPRK. Left's detailed analysis of a missile that struck Kharkiv on January 2 revealed its origins through unique characteristics and components manufactured in the DPRK. Despite Russia's dismissal of these accusations as baseless, the findings corroborate open-source reports and analyses of unlawful arms transfers between the DPRK and Russia. The US accused Russia of launching missiles procured from North Korea at Ukraine, while Russia's UN ambassador Vasily Nebenzia refuted these claims, accusing the West of escalating regional tensions. North Korea's UN ambassador Kim Song condemned the US and its allies as the main culprits of global conflict, defending DPRK-Russia relations as peace-loving and defensive. China's deputy UN ambassador Gung Shuang called for rational and pragmatic cooperation to cool down the situation on the Korean peninsula while the U.S. urged China to use its influence to end the dangerous military cooperation between DPRK and Russia. South China Morning Post, the IPO market in Hong Kong, which had slumped to a two-decade low in the first half of the year, is set for a revival as mainland Chinese firms SF Holding and Beijing Tong Rintang Healthcare Investment filed applications to raise funds. SF Holding, the parent of courier operator SF Express, plans to issue 625.5 million shares and use the proceeds to enhance its logistic services in Asia. Beijing Tong Rintang, China's largest non-public traditional Chinese medicine hospital group, aims to upgrade its medical institutions with the funds raised. The potential mega-deal by SF Holding is a much-needed boost for Hong Kong's primary market, which saw fundraising on the main board drop to US$1.5 billion US dollars in the first six months, the lowest since 2003. Bonnie Chan, CEO of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, HKEX, highlighted a positive outlook for the IPO market, with over 100 applications under review. The Hang Seng Index's 5.5% rise year-to-date signals better valuations for companies seeking to list. Additionally, Singapore-based container depot operator EKH has appointed coordinators for its Hong Kong IPO, reflecting improved market liquidity and valuations. Deloitte anticipates an active pipeline of IPO applicants, specialist technology companies, DSPAC transactions, 
and prominent Chinese businesses driving the market in the second half of 2024. South China Morning Post, drawn by the allure of BTS and K-dramas, Chinese tourists are flocking back to South Korea in record numbers after years of setbacks. The famed South Korean boy band BTS has made Jeju Island a must-visit destination for its fans, with travel agencies meticulously organizing tours to the same hotels and Buddhist temples the superstars frequent. Similarly, the volcanic island has become a hotspot for fans of the Korean television series Welcome to Sandalry. Favorable travel policies, such as visa-free entry for Chinese nationals transiting to a third country, have facilitated this resurgence. The Jeju Tourism Organization reports a steady increase in Chinese visitors from January to April this year, surpassing the total number of visitors in 2023. According to the Korea Times, the number of Chinese tourists increased by 470% in the first four months of this year compared to the same period last year. South Korea has become the second most popular destination for Chinese tourists, following Japan, with over 1 million trips made in the first quarter alone. Economic uncertainties at home and affordable flights, such as round-trip tickets from Beijing or Shanghai to Seoul costing around 180 US dollars, make South Korea an attractive short-trip destination. Chinese tourists often visit historic sites in Seoul, K-pop monuments, themed cafes, and enjoy the vibrant nightlife in areas like Itiwan. Travel operators in Busan are eager for more direct flights from China to promote the city's beaches and coastal temples. The tourism boom follows the lifting of travel barriers that had been in place since 2017 due to geopolitical tensions and the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the increase in arrivals, the growth has not met all expectations, with experts hoping for a better turnout during the summer vacation period. Thank you for tuning in. The content above showcases the latest briefing reports and analytical synopses, thoughtfully curated by the 6 Do team. These insights stem from a wide array of reputable media outlets, think tanks, government sources, and specialized experts worldwide. We encourage you to explore these sources for a comprehensive perspective. Keep in mind that while the content may not always align with the official standpoint of 6 Do Brief, it's not meant to be taken as absolute directives for decision-making. Comprising seasoned media professionals, learned scholars, and accomplished scientists, the 6 Do team embodies a trailblazing, fully independent media entity. To customize 6 Do Brief to meet your professional needs, you have the option to subscribe to a diverse array of briefings on our website, 6 Regardless of your location, you can conveniently receive 6 Do Brief via email.